We've got the first of two for you here tonight. We begin with West Virginia and Portland State, the Mountaineers and the Vikings for the right to play in the fifth place game of the Phil Knight legacy. And the man himself is in the house to watch some basketball. We just talked with him. He told us he's been here all day long, going back and forth from building to building, watching basketball. And that means he saw a very interesting game a little bit earlier today. The Cyclones knock off North Carolina. Caleb Grill with 31 points. And Iowa State is into the championship game on their side of the bracket. Carolina will play for third. That's in the Phil Knight Invitational. Over here in the Phil Knight Legacy, it was Duke over Xavier. 71 to 64, led by 21 from Jeremy Roach. So Duke will play for the championship on this side against the winner of Purdue and Gonzaga, which just happens to be the next game that we'll have for you a little bit later on tonight. And that one is on ESPN. But first, let's talk about this one. Welcome back to Portland. Dan Schulman, Jay Billis, West Virginia, Portland State. Two teams we know they're going to play hard to try to get W tonight. Both teams like to force turnovers. They like to put great pressure on the ball. The key is going to be execution, being strong with the ball, not turning it over, let the team, the other team take it the other way, and then rebounding. Bob Huggins said after West Virginia's loss to Purdue that his team refuses to rebound. They better not refuse it against Portland State. I wouldn't refuse to do anything Bob Huggins tells me to do. It's uh, Portland State in white, West Virginia in dark blue, Earl Walton, Darren George, Scott Brown, the officials, and we are underway here at the Moda Center, the home of the NBA's Portland Trailblazers, the Mountaineers with the first possession of the game. And into Jimmy Bell Jr., the big guy for West Virginia. He is surrounded and fouled. And notable from the games we did last night, there's a, a change in the starting lineup. And it la well, I didn't even get a chance to say it. It lasted 14 <laughs> seconds. I was going to say, boy, they've gone small, Jay. And then 14 seconds into the game, here comes Jacob Iman. It's probably late to training meal. <laughs> Well, maybe uh, Jace Coburn, his coach, didn't want him to pick up an early foul, so somebody else picked up the early foul. Adrian Johnson at the point for West Virginia. You can tell that West Virginia looking to punch the ball inside early to Jimmy Bell Jr. Let him go to work. Bell and Iman, both physical players. And here come the Vikings for the first time tonight. Keep an eye on number 23. That's him, Jarrell Satterfield. Averaging better than 18 a game, and he knocked down five threes against Gonzaga last night. Well, Satterfield had 21 points in that game against Gonzaga. He was a terrific scorer at UTEP. Shot 43% from three there. And he got off to a little bit of a slow start against Gonzaga, but then heated up in a hurry. And the guy with the ball right now for the Mountaineers, Eric Stevenson, a transfer most recently at South Carolina. He could really fill it up for them. Oh, a push. Just an easy call. I mean, he's an important guy, and that's just, I mean, the official can't help but blow the whistle on that one. Looking for a lob. It was just well scouted and well defended by Portland State. Iman was right there to cut off Stevenson, so he couldn't get that lob. You just don't throw it. And the first sigh and look of resignation of the night on the face of Bob Huggins, the Hall of Famer Bob Huggins, inducted into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame this past September. Bob Huggins not happy with his team's turnovers against Purdue. They coughed it up, what, 18 times, and so many of the turnovers were, you know, throwing the ball at the guy's feet, just poor decisions rather than somebody taking the ball away from you. Johnson comes up with a steal and a nice crossover in lay-in to get West Virginia on the board. Adrian Johnson is so important for this team, running it, keying the defense with his pressure. He was in foul trouble against Purdue and had to sit for a good part of the first half, and that was really debilitating for West Virginia. Satterfield takes a feed from Cameron Parker, and he turns it over. Johnson does a good job of when somebody spins, you can go get it, and he goes right after that steal. It's really well done by Kedrian Johnson. Both of these teams, and this is not uncommon in college basketball these days, a lot of turnover from last year, a lot of transfers. So they're still getting to know each other. Whoa, what a finish there by Emmett Matthews Jr., who's going to the line as well. Boy, that was a strong take. Emmett Matthews Jr. getting to his left hand. He is left-handed. 
just goes right into the body. Looked like he lost the ball just for a second, regained control, and then kissed it off the glass. And the foul on Jacob Iman, his first. Now Matthews is a transfer as well, but that comes with an asterisk. He started his career in Morgantown, and then he's from Tacoma, Washington, went to play at the University of Washington last year. But then apparently, you know, it's senior day for them last year, and he's thinking, man, I should be... When, when this day happens for me, I, I kind of feel like I should be in Morgantown. And he transferred back to West Virginia and by all accounts was welcomed back with open arms. This is Cameron Parker. You liked what you saw from him last night. I thought Parker was terrific. He, he just had a terrific game against Gonzaga. He's just a good player. Look, going down on the deck and still able to pitch it back and get it to Bobby Harvey for that shot. 6'4 senior Harvey from Chicago, a transfer from IUPUI. And getting down the floor and scoring quickly is Trey Mitchell. He feels like a real key for the Mountaineers. Well, he didn't have a very good game against Purdue. Only two points, two rebounds. He had a rough matchup going up against Zach Eady at times. And he got in foul trouble early on, similar to what Kedrick, Kedrick Johnson had. But he's got to have a better game for West Virginia to win. West Virginia lost to Purdue 80-68. to and Portland State lost to Gonzaga 102 to 78. So that's how they find themselves on this side of the bracket right now. And we are seeing good pace. And we expected good pace, especially Portland State. They want to play kind of a helter skelter game. Well, so does West Virginia. But that, that pass by Johnson just wasn't a good one. I mean, he got bailed out of that turnover by an offensive foul. They were losing the ball anyway. But there, there was no way that pass was getting through absent that foul. Satterfield. Boy, they don't hold on to it long. If they see a sliver of an opening, the ball's going up. Well, especially Satterfield, because if you if you don't take those openings, they're going to close up. And a foul on Iman, and that's going to be his second. Remember, he's the big guy who didn't start the game, came in 14 seconds into the game, and he's already picked up two fouls. Uh, now Portland State, they've got to go to the bench. Well, the fouls have been the same. You know, he's supposed to go straight up there, and he's allowed that space all the way up to the ceiling. But what he's doing is jumping into the offensive player, that time Mitchell, Trey Mitchell, and he's throwing his chest into him. And that does, there are a lot of, a lot of players that do that and get away with it, but Iman's been able, unable to get away with it. So he will sit, and Portland State will get smaller. A couple of 6'6 six, six guys just came in. Isaiah Johnson, a transfer from Oregon State, and Hunter Woods. Another transfer, he played at Elon, and he's averaging about 12 points and six and a half rebounds per game. Jace Coburn, the head coach, sorry, Jay, he'll use 12 or 13 guys tonight, right? Yeah, and, and actually, some of his bench players are, are better than some of the starters uh, because they play so many people. It just gives them good balance when they do go to their bench. They don't take a drop off. Nice pass. <laughs> And the reverse says, boy, uh, Johnson went underneath the bucket instead of laying it in on the near side. Satterfield misses the corner three. Stevenson puts his head down and knocks down a baseline jumper. That's a tough shot. Boy, he takes one hard, last hard dribble and just explodes up into that shot and most of the time goes straight up and down unless the defense causes him to fade away a little bit. But he, he's one terrific pull-up jump shooter. You are known to say from time to time, so-and-so is wired to score. Eric Stevenson, wired to score. Beautiful feed there from Keyshawn Saunders to a wide-open Isaiah Johnson. Just over-pursuit on the help there. Two guys left, uh, left them wide open. You just can't do that. Good switch by Parker to take away that jump shot by Stevenson. Johnson misses the three and down with the rebound Parker and they're pushing again. Good defense from behind by Kedri and Johnson to force the turnover and rewarded with an and one opportunity at the other end. Portland State is contesting everything but they're not contesting it intelligently. That was not a smart foul. Especially not smart to give up the basket and the foul. Jace Coburn, head coach of the Vikings, two dogs and one bone. We'll explain on the other side. That's one unhappy dog, then. That's all that means. <laughs> ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Nike. Just do it.
three keys. Okay, one is we need to do the big things today for 40 minutes. Big things, charges, loose balls, deflections, extra pass, and one! Rebounds, they gotta get hit every single time tonight, okay? Second thing is, I want the ultimate compliment. We're going for it all tonight, okay? Not only are we gonna win tonight, okay, but we're gonna walk out of here and everybody's gonna say Portland State's the tougher team than West Virginia, okay? We're going for the ultimate tonight. We're going for the ultimate, okay? Third key, okay? Talked about it last night briefly, okay? There's two pit bulls in this game right now. There's two, okay? There's only one bone, okay? We eating tonight or not? Let's go eat tonight, He gets his players fired up, doesn't he? That is Jace Cobert, his second year as the head coach of the Vikings, a guy who started coaching AAU Bowl when he was 18 years old and has coached high school, junior college. At the junior college level, Jay, he was coaching players who were older than him, and you can see that fire's burning pretty strong within him. Well, he's definitely hungry. He's got a ton of energy, and he's got a team that clearly believes in him, but if they want that bone tonight, they're going to have to keep West Virginia out of their yard, and their yard is painted orange right now because West Virginia is getting to the rim, both in transition and the half court, just about whenever they feel like it. Baseline drive and a pretty lay in there for Isaiah Johnson. It's not just getting beat off the dribble. Little trouble Bob Huggins about that. That's one thing, but there was no help defense. I mean, nobody was in the hole ready to step over and get outside the lane and take a charge or stop that dribble. Oh boy, Mitchell was looking to do something else with the ball, couldn't find anybody and banked it in. Kind of slow played that one, but it worked out. Portland State, for those not aware, they play out of the Big Sky Conference. They've been to the NCAA tournament twice in program history, 2008, 2009. They are picked seventh in the Big Sky this year. Again, a lot of turnover. They're not a very big team. The way that they want to compete is by doing all the things that Coach Coburn was talking about. Helter-skelter, play fast, cause turnovers, run and gun a little bit. Defeated Gonzaga back in 2008 when the Zags were ranked seventh. And you talked about Freeman Williams last night, second all-time leading scorer in Division I basketball history behind only Pistol Pete. Scored over 3,200 points to Freeman Williams. Just a great scorer here at Portland State. Nice soft touch on the jump hook for Mitchell. Two great years at UMass, a season that didn't go as well at Texas last year, and now playing for his third program in West Virginia. On just about every drive into the paint for Portland State, they need to start coming to a two footed jump stop and play off of two feet. You know, that was just too easy to give up that charge. Once you get into the paint, draw some help, then you can spray it, play out of it. But West Virginia is going to be able to get charge after charge if the Vikings don't start playing off of two feet on some of these drives. Second foul on Michael Starks, the second Viking to pick up two fouls already. And now Mo Wagi and Trey Mitchell can't get together on a pass, and that's a turnover that is not going to please Bob Huggins. It's just simple patch, uh, pass and catch stuff. I mean, these aren't forced turnovers. And it's not to say that Portland State's not playing good defense, but that wasn't a forced turnover. That was just simple pass and catch. The next win for Bob Huggins moves him past Jim Calhoun into sole possession of third place on the all-time men's Division I win list. Mike Krzyzewski, Jim Beheim, and right now Jim Calhoun and Bob Huggins are tied for third at 920. Just a, a remarkable career that Bob Huggins has had and is having in basketball just one of the truly great coaches of all time and a bad inbounds pass is stolen away stevenson is wide open for three Boy, transition basketball the three-point line is a bigger deal than it has ever been and you now can't just get back in your transition defense to protect the lane protect the rim you've got to find shooters and stevenson is the first one you have to find Strong drive and a chance for three for Cameron Parker. Off to another good start tonight. He had 16 points and eight assists against Gonzaga, and I thought had a, a terrific floor game against the Zags. Left-handed, usually keeps his eyes up, and just took advantage of an angle for a straight-line drive against Joe Toussaint. 
and was able not only to get the contact, but the and one opportunity. Should I have screamed that like Jace did in the, <laughs> the locker room? Can you imagine try, Can you imagine having that much energy? I mean, you get your players' attention, that's for sure. Parker, by the way, a Portland native, a guy who spent a couple of years at Sacred Heart, then played at Montana while he was at Sacred Heart. Mentioned this last night, set an NCAA record with 24 assists in a game. Nice look, but wide open underneath for the easy slam is Matthews. Good cut by Matthews into the open area. Much better movement from West Virginia in this game versus the game they had against Purdue. A foul on Waggy is going to send Satterfield to the line for the Vikings. You can see Matthews just a little bit of a back cut. They lost him. Nobody picked him up. Just moving to an open area instead of standing there. And look, I realize against Purdue, you, know, you try to cut in the middle. Zach Eady was right. in there. But I didn't think the, the movement that West Virginia had against Purdue was nearly as good as it should have been or could have been. You give credit to Purdue's defense because it was very good. Purdue Gonzaga should be a, a really interesting game. Coming up in our second game tonight over on ESPN, obviously Drew Timmy, one of the best big men in the nation for the Zags, and Zach Eady. He's been about as productive as any big guy in the country so far this young season. Joe Toussaint had a really nice game off the bench for the Mountaineers last night. 34 minutes off the bench, scored 16 points in a losing effort against Purdue, but a very experienced guy, three years at Iowa. And they needed him because Johnson was in foul trouble. Really nice pull-up jumper there off the triple handoff. You know, the Mountaineers still figuring out who they are, but you look at some of the individual pieces. Stevenson can score, Toussaint, a, a good, experienced player. Emmett Matthews Jr., the same thing. There are some pieces here for Bob Huggins to be competitive in the Big 12 this year. They'll be competitive, but I think they have to defend at a higher level, and they have to rebound at a much higher level. But they have guys this year, as opposed to last year, that can make more shots. And you can see some of the transfers and the numbers they bring with them to Morgantown as the first free throw is missed for Portland State by Kendall Munson, a 6'8 sophomore, a transfer from Pepperdine. Wagee out and James Aconquo is in for West Virginia. You know, to the point on defense, West Virginia can't have breakdowns like they just had. I mean, it was a, a simple little drive. And then Parker's able to find a, a wide open Kendall Munson underneath. I mean, there's not enough resistance from West Virginia. And the Vikings miss an opportunity at the line and then on the offensive rebound after the miss. Toussaint cut off by Isaiah Kirby, who is checked in. But Stevenson free for a three. Misses wide left. Boy, nice job by Parker to get down, grab that board. Kicks it out to a wide open. Hunter Woods, who couldn't knock down the three, and we've got a man down for the Mountaineers, and it's Stevenson. Stevenson went down last night. We thought it might have been a cramp, but it was just that it was that sprained foot that he had been dealing with. And Bob Huggins said after the game, he's been dealing with it for a while. He's okay, but not sure what this is. Didn't see him go down. We will get a look going to break. Ten in blue. Kind of knee to knee there, and then they got their... Yeah, got their feet tangled up. And Munson fell on the left leg of Stevenson. We will try to update you. Hopefully he's okay. We'll get more when we come back. Welcome back to Portland. Eric Stevenson are being helped off the court with the assistance of a couple of staff members for the West Virginia program. And uh, he got tangled up in an inadvertent but unfortunate collision. We don't know what it is and don't want to speculate, but you can see there's contact there, and then they get kind of their ankles tied up, and then Munson inadvertently falls backwards on the left leg of Stevenson, and hopefully it's nothing too serious. Well, before there was contact, it looked like Munson rolled his ankle, which in part looked like it led to, to that problem, but you hope Stevenson's going to be okay. But thus far in the game, West Virginia shooting 77%. I mean, they're 10 of 13. And already, both Emmett Matthews Jr. and Trey Mitchell 
have crushed what they did last night against Purdue. They've combined for 15 points, six of six. Both of them are three of three from the field. Matthews going over a thousand career points with his tally tonight. Really the benchmark of a great career. <laughs> a Conquo off to Tucson, who lays it in. Just too easy. West Virginia just playing so comfortably on the offensive end without a lot of disruption. Long rebound by Kirby, and he'll walk it back out. Parker guarded by Tucson. Munson. And maybe affecting that shot a little bit of Conquo, and it didn't hit the rim, so that'll be a shot clock violation. College football rivalry weekend continues tomorrow night. Number six, USC, still with college football playoff hopes. Host number 15, Notre Dame at the Coliseum. Coverage begins at 7.30 Eastern on ABC and the ESPN app. Did you go to any Notre Dame USC games when you were growing up in Southern California? I never actually went to one of the games growing up in LA, but obviously watched every one. And remember most the one where Anthony Davis dominated the Irish. It seemed like he was returning every kick, whether it was a punt or a kickoff. He was just fantastic in that game. That was back when John McKay was coaching the Trojans. Toussaint with a bucket, his second of the night. He's got four, and the lead has grown to 13 now for the Mountaineers. And Munson stepped out of bounds, driving the baseline. That's already six turnovers committed by Portland State in this game. Make it seven, seven turnovers committed by the Vikings. I think for West Virginia in this game, continue attacking the paint. They've just been dominant getting the ball to the rim. 14 of their 28 in the paint. Toby Johnson in the game now, number two in blue. Looking for some help, and he turns it over. And now numbers, Saunders in transition, draws the foul. Well, that was a nice defensive effort, I think, by Joe Toussaint. It looked like he was going to fly by, and he gave that impression. And then Woods looked like he was going to go for a little Euro step, and Toussaint didn't fly by. But that's just, that's just not a good pass. Trying to get it out. But that was a good job by Toussaint. Ultimately, they wound up getting fouled, but he didn't give up an easy layup. My mistake, not Saunders. That is Hunter Woods, as you mentioned. 19 points last Saturday in a road win at Oregon State. Had a double-double against Portland earlier this season. Yeah, Hunter Woods is the leading rebounder for this team. He didn't have a great rebounding effort in game one against Gonzaga, but he also leads the team in steals to over two per game. Woods knocks him down, and here comes Saunders into the game. He will take the place of Parker. Pressure, and they almost force a turnover. A pretty nice second option for Bob Huggins to be able to bring a guy like Joe Toussaint off the bench to play the point for whatever reason, whether it's alongside Keatery and Johnson or in place of a very experienced player. Meanwhile, on the other side, the Phil Knight Invitational. There's another game getting ready to start just across the way at Veterans Memorial Coliseum. UConn and Alabama in what should be a great game. And Jay, the winner, plays Iowa State in the championship game on that side after the Cyclones knocked off North Carolina earlier today. Iowa State was so strong on the defensive end. I mean, they just bogarted North Carolina the whole game, held them to, what, 61 points. And Caleb Grill had 31. And the, the shots he was making, the depth of them, catch off the, you know, off the dribble, off the catch, just an extraordinary performance by Caleb Grill. And I know you're a big fan of Adama Sanogo of the Huskies. 
yet another one of the, the outstanding big men across the country. Should be a great game between Connecticut and Alabama. We've still got Purdue and Gonzaga coming up in our second game tonight. And Alabama is going to continue to get better. They, they've got one of the best freshmen in the country, if not the best, Brandon Miller. You know, he's averaging well over 20 points per game. He's got great size and can really shoot it, can get to the rim. He's athletic. You're going to be hearing his name very high up in the NBA draft. Meanwhile, Jay was just told that Kansas is down 14 to Tennessee in the late in the last minute of play in the championship game down at the Battle of uh, at Atlantis down in the Bahamas. That's a that's a big win for Rick Barnes's team. Johnson and a block is the call and Johnson is down. Bodies are flying everywhere in this one. Johnson back up seems to be all right limping a little bit as he heads to the free throw line. And they're going to call it before the shot. So non shooting. It is a, a final now. Kansas has lost. So on the same day, and again, rankings, they're going to fluctuate wildly at the beginning of the season. But number one, Carolina, number three, Kansas both lose on the same day. Johnson into the paint. Mitchell with the offensive rebound for the Mountaineers. And we have a held ball that will give it to Portland State. But Portland State just swarmed. As soon as Mitchell grabbed that rebound, brought it down below his shoulders. Seemed like there were six arms in there to tie it up. But he brings it down, and then boom. Well, four arms. Now a turnover sending it back the other way as Bob Huggins will make a substitution. He's going to bring Jimmy Bell Jr. back into the game. The 6'8 junior. Uh, a guy who over the last year or so, Jay, has lost 75 pounds. He's still got plenty left and he knows how to use it because he is really strong. I mean, he was matching Zach Eady strength for strength in that game against Purdue. A little zone look right now. At least it looks like it. There's not a lot of movement. That's why it looks like zone. Bell bullying his way into the paint and then spun the other way, but does draw the foul. If you're going to bring the double, you got to bring it earlier before he can drop step back to the basket because he was just able to get between those two defenders. And he's just playing bully ball there. Number two on Jarrell Satterfield. Jace Coburn wanted clarification who the foul was on. And it is Satterfield with the reach, the second on him. He wants to make sure he knows who, who got the foul in case he has to make a sub. And meanwhile, good news for the Mountaineers. Look who's back. Eric Stevenson's okay. It was unfortunate for West Virginia against Purdue that Jimmy Bell Jr. got in foul trouble. And he's 6'10", and he's so strong. He could he could handle guarding Zach Eady when nobody else on the roster could. He could push him off the lane, make it difficult. You're excited for, and it'll be not just him, uh, not just them on either side. Oh, hold that thought, because we're going to a break. <laughs> you always ask me the best questions yeah, right know. before the break. Rule number one, don't ask your analyst a question when you're about to go to a timeout. Welcome back to Portland our scene for our spot for wall to wall basketball for several days here both men's and women's basketball at the Phil Knight Invitational and the Phil Knight Legacy. This is uh, the men's bracket on the other side the Invitational UConn and Alabama just getting going on ESPN the winner will play Iowa State for a title the loser will play North Carolina for third place and then the Phil Knight Legacy in the women's bracket has a game. Getting going on ESPNU. It is Iowa and Oregon State with the winner to advance to take on UConn in the championship there. A total of 
24 teams, two eight team men's brackets and two four team women's brackets all week long here in Portland. All right, whichever team winds up winning the second semifinal for the chance to take on Iowa State when they get to Iowa State, you better you better strap that chin strap up tight because that is going to be a physical contest where they're going to put body on body for 40 minutes. We are here at the Moda Center just across the way about a 20 second walk outside is the Veterans Memorial Coliseum and a few miles away the Child Center and games rotating between all three buildings over the holiday week. Keyshawn Saunders had some nice minutes in this game. He transferred in from Toledo. He hit over 83s playing for the Rockets. So right now. Portland State has to figure out a way to get some stops and keep this Mountaineer team out of the, la of the lane. It's not like they're running offense that's getting them a, a bunch of assists. There's a lot of individual plays where they're forcing help and making it difficult for Portland State to guard one on one. Yeah, they've scored 14 points in the paint. They've turned eight Portland State turnovers into 14 points. And as a result of getting so close to the basket so often, they're shooting 71%. 12 for 17. But even with those numbers, it seems like Portland State is closer than they should be. Johnson, too strong, and through the hands of Wilson to the Vikings. Awfully difficult shot. Saunders has it taken away. Mitchell forced the turnover. Stevenson in the corner for three. Well, you make a mistake. Now all of a sudden you're put in scramble. And you have to make decisions on the fly and not picking up Eric Stevenson by the three point line early is a one of those mistakes. But when you put the ball in the deck West Virginia is knocking it away. All of a sudden you're running back in transition. West Virginia has an advantage situation and they are looking and running to that deep corner running to the three point line It used to be you ran wide and then went to get to the basket. Sometimes you even cross underneath. Those days are over. You're trying to get to the corners to flatten out that defense. And the corner three is a, a really efficient shot, even in transition. And one that Eric Stevenson enjoys, a guy who has been around playing at Wichita State, Washington, South Carolina. Frank Martin was let go, and then so he transferred to play for Bob Huggins his one last year. And he is filling it up in the early part of the season for the Mountaineers. Just got a great stroke. A couple of free throws for Parker. Well, one, two, two, three quarter court pressure. Travel on Matthews in the corner. He looks perplexed. So does Hugs. This is Isaiah Kirby. Soft off the glass, but couldn't get it to go. But the foul is there for Hunter Woods. Right, Bob Huggins not happy with that. You go for the block shot, it leaves the offensive glass wide open. Just not a rotation down. You're not seeing all five Mountaineers go after the glass. And that's what, you know, offensive rebounding is one thing. But all five guys got to go for the rebound. And Eric Stevens is probably lucky he didn't get a push in the back on that. Then he didn't come over and try to cut off the cut off the rim on the other side. Portland State with five offensive rebounds already in this game. And a three for Woods and here come the Vikings. That's the kind of thing that drives Bob Huggins crazy. He wants to be the one that gets extra possessions. Johnson a little bit fortunate there. He got the foul but he almost wrapped that left arm around. And oftentimes if the officials see it. Matt or excuse me it was Trey Mitchell. I mean you basically if you you can't get caught in no man's land there you just got to stay on the corner shooter because there was no he wasn't helping on the drive so just face guard him stay on him. 
One and one for Kadrian Johnson, who had 11 points and three assists in 22 minutes last night against Purdue. Fifth year senior from Dallas. Well, it feels like when you're shooting 70% as West Virginia was last time we checked, it might have dropped down to 68 or something, but you feel like there should be more separation than this. Well, I'll tell you, Hunter Woods is making plays right now. He is headed to the free throw line, and I, I think Bob Huggins would agree with you 100%. Well, I mean, just after that, it, that was a made free throw, and Portland State's able to get all the way to the rim. That's got to be disconcerting. I, mean, I think Bob Huggins is asking, can we guard anybody? And will we? But these guys, he, he has praised how much they, this team works. And there are a lot of new pieces from last year, and, and nobody expects to have them figured out, everything figured out right now. But all these teams get to keep working. I remember saying that last year about Kansas. They, and even I didn't think they were going to win the national championship, but you knew early on, hey, they're going to keep getting better. They get to go to work every day in practice. Just because they lose a game here or there doesn't mean they're not capable. And I think because there's so much more turnover now in college basketball than before, like years ago, maybe we had a better feel of what a team is in November, December. But now what a team is in November, December could be drastically different from what they are in February, March. Yeah, I think that's true, maybe a little bit, just because, as you point out, there are a lot more new pieces now because of the transfer portal and uh, because so many players leave early. But you know, even even back in the dark ages when I played with Matthew Brady took the team picture, um, you know, the teams weren't fully formed in November. And this is the, you know, back in the day, this is when the season started, right? These guys are five yeah. games in. Yeah, after Thanksgiving or the, right about that. that time, right yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. Practice started October 15th. That's not the date anymore. It's 45 days before your first game. And usually your first game is like November 7th. Ten point lead West Virginia and a steal by Mitchell. Stevenson with a nice look inside to Wagi, the junior college All-American. Kicks it out of it a missed three for Johnson. Boy, they had an advantage situation, couldn't get the rim, came away with nothing on that possession. Kirby. A little bump they play on. Johnson. And this time a block on Kirby and Johnson's headed right back to the free throw line. Yeah, Johnson absorbed a big bump bringing it down. And just got into the lane easily before picking up that block call. That was right after he took that pretty good sized bump in transition. So Johnson at the line for two. He's already attempted five free throws in the game. He's made four of them. And he's got the ability to be such a good defender and has been. And he's got really good hands and gets a lot of deflections. We've seen him get a couple steals in this one. They missed him when he was out against Purdue. He sat, what, 24 minutes in yeah. the first half? Had a long time. He had some foul trouble. Two or three of their key players had some foul trouble last night, and they would have had to have played really well to beat Purdue in the first place. You would think, but that made it a lot tougher on them. And well, they hung in there. I mean, yep. they had a chance late in the game, which early on it didn't look like they would. I mean, they only shot what 41 percent from the field, hit like five of 20, five of 25 from three-point range. It was not a great offensive performance. Good pass. But out of bounds, unable to handle the pass was Isaiah Johnson after a nice find by Cameron Parker. You got to catch that one. That's a dunk. And Parker makes so many good passes. Yeah, if his assist totals are down, it's because they're not catching him or they're not knocking the shots down, probably. He's always finding people. Mitchell splits the double team, throws it up off balance, and it goes. The double team came over, but he made a quick move. 
better transition defense. Fell asleep there. And another great find from Parker, but this time it slips out of the hands of Saunders. Yeah, Stevenson on that cut. He needs to bump the cutter when they're going through. You're not supposed to do that, but it's, not, it's never called. So West Virginia with a 14 point lead over the Portland State Vikings here. The winner will advance to play Florida for fifth place. The loser will play Oregon State for seventh place in the Phil Knight legacy bracket. Stevenson with a turnaround. Waggy with a nice rebound. Something that he does exceptionally well or at least did at the junior college ranks a year ago. Just took it right over the top of two Portland State Vikings. Six ten, two twenty five, long from the Bronx. Got good mobility. His feet are really good. Misses them both. Munson down with a rebound. Satterfield needs to touch the ball. He's in the corner right now. And they turn it over again. Two on one, West Virginia. Wagge the finish, Stevenson the assist. Well, that's the way West Virginia wants to play. Just create advantage situations. The ultimate advantage is one on oh, and you're going to be pretty close to it here. Stevenson misses the wing three offensive rebound, though, for Josiah Harris. And then Johnson knocks down his man after handing it off at his call for the offensive foul. We will step aside with 336 to go in the first half here in Portland. West Virginia with a healthy lead. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Lowe's. It's the best place to get everything you need for the holidays. You know, somehow, given everything we know, none of that was surprising that Bill Walton was singing happy birthday with a beaver to Phil Knight. I'm told that there were multiple calls to social services <laughs> from nearby <laughs> residents. But this is the dunking. This is not just any. Beaver Jay Billis. This is the dunking Beaver. Two hand finish. Very impressive. Hanging on the rim, yeah, though. Yeah. Class B technical foul. 16 point lead for the Mountaineers. Late stages in the first half. Right, West Virginia has forced a ton of turnovers in this first half. They forced, what is it, 14? This is 15 now. And they have scored 21 points off those turnovers. Stevenson, offensive foul. And he is pointing down to the restricted arc, saying the defender was in the circle. He could also point down and point to a two footed jump stop. You get into the lane when there's a secondary defender, if you come to a two footed jump stop, yeah, he wasn't in there. No. Now, did he jump in front of him? Was he set? The answer, I think, is no, but you have to expect that you're going to get a charge on those plays the way the game's called. And, you know, two footed jump stop, you know, obviates that charge call. I'm in the kick, Satterfield. He has not gotten a look in a while, but he knocks down the corner three. He has not really been moving much without the ball. And just by getting it into Iman. Open that up because of the help defense. Boy, he can't come off him. Pretty ball movement in transition as Mitchell finds Seth Wilson in the corner, and the sophomore from Lorraine, Ohio, knocks down a three. There's a split in the post that opens it up for Iman to go one on one. He doesn't look to score very often, averaging just one point per game on the season coming in, but a soft touch with the left hand. 
And now he deflects one away at the other end. Six ten junior from Los Alamitos, California. Hyman was a, a volleyball player. Must have been a presence up at the net, I would imagine, don't you think? I would think. Yeah. <laughs> Having to move his feet out on the perimeter now guarding the opposing point guard and Johnson doing a good job. And a turnover. Parker in transition. All the way. Boy, what a great finish by Cameron Parker. You mentioned he started his, he went to Jesuit High School here in Portland. Portland has produced a, a lot of outstanding players in the high school ranks. Wagee and Iman might have gotten a piece of that. And then a turnover as Starks dribbled it off the back of his foot, trying to spin in traffic, and Johnson lays it in. Yeah, guess who? It was Kedrian Johnson, who gets so many deflections and steals. Final minute of the first half. And nothing that Iman could do about that one. He can't climb the ladder like Wagee can. 50 points for West Virginia. Honestly, I think Bob Huggins would probably be first to admit it should be more. I mean, they should have 60. A lot in transition, a lot in around the rim, a lot at the free throw line as well. Satterfield. And that'll be Vikings ball. Good job by the big guy running the floor. Giving that opportunity, just getting out in front. Too many guys jogging back defensively. A quick three off the inbounds won't go down. Long loose ball though bounces back out to Bobby Harvey. How about that rejection by Trey Mitchell? Caught him with the foul though, got him with the body. Like Parker, especially when he's driving left, does a really good job of getting his shoulders past the defender. He turns the corner really effectively. Did a good job of shielding the ball so that Mitchell had to go over that right shoulder to get near the ball. He didn't necessarily have to foul him just to get a piece of it. So the foul on Mitchell Parker knocks down the first a couple of subs for the Mountaineers as they get their assignments clear here they figure to get the ball back with 18.5 to go and the shot clock turned off. And Isaiah Johnson in for Kendall Munson on defense. Bob Huggins will use a timeout to set something up. We will step aside for 30. West Virginia with 50 already. And a last shot potentially coming here. Well, you always love when you can score before the other team can set up five on five and forcing turnovers, getting out in transition. The Mountaineers' defense has led to some useful offense tonight. Yeah, a good performance overall in the first half. There, there were some turnovers that I think Bob Huggins would be unhappy with. I think the first 10 minutes of the first half, give or take, it was not the kind of effort that he would have said was their best. But overall, there were some really good things from West Virginia in this first half. Shot clock turned off. Toussaint into the front court. Here comes the high ball screen. Toussaint turned it down, went the other way. And the three will go in for Wilson in the closing seconds of the first half. And West Virginia puts 53 on the board in the opening 20 minutes against Portland State. Always nice when you take that use it or lose it timeout and you score off of it. So 53-36, not sure this was the way that they drew it up. But 
It sure worked out well for them. Seth Wilson on the broken play. A nice find by Tucson. And knocks it down. 17 point lead. Mountaineers. Here at halftime in this game in the Phil Knight legacy bracket West Virginia putting 53 on the board they shot over 65 percent they alley oop they drove they got to the line they got out in transition they turned the Vikings over and they're up 17 we got another game a big game with a big guy Zach Eady of Purdue 24 and 12 against West Virginia last night and tonight the Boilermakers will take on the number six team of the nation the Gonzaga Bulldogs for a spot in the championship game against the Duke Blue Devils who held off the Xavier Musketeers winning by seven a little bit earlier today. It should be great. Uh, these two guys drew Timmy and Zach Eady and it's team versus team. But Jay it's hard not to focus on the big guys when you talk about the game. No question. Uh, Zach Eady drew Timmy. Uh, I don't know that those two will necessarily guard each other. Uh, I, I think you'll see uh, a different matchup whether it's Anton Watson whether it's uh, the, the other big guy for Gonzaga it's not going to be Timmy in my view because that's going to put Timmy in foul trouble but really for Gonzaga they've got to find a way to get Zach Eady away from the lane away from the rim if they put him into ball screen action he'll be in drop coverage uh, so I think guys like Rajir Bolton if it's him he can come off and pull up for jump shots and that's going to be key is how the guards shoot the ball for more on the game tonight here's Brooke Weisbrod with Purdue coach Matt Painter coach this tournament amongst the whole country the talk is about big men you have 10 guys 6'6 six, six or bigger that's the biggest in program history including Zach Eady what do you like about that matchup tonight especially against Drew Timmy well it's going to be interesting you know I don't know if they'll just they'll match up a lot Drew Timmy and Zach Eady um, they, they have a good front line we obviously have a good front line um, I think there's more to it than that obviously I think guard play is going to be a a uh, big part of this game, but you know, both of us want to get the ball, you know, to our main guys and then be able to play through them. And you both are great ball managers, not giving up a lot of turnovers, creating assists for your team. What do you feel like might be the difference in that stat? I think for us, it's just trying to execute, you know, just kind of taking what they give us, not trying to force things, but our ball movement and our screening, we have to cut hard. We have to make it tough. If they can just sit there and help and see what's going on, it'll be difficult. Thanks, Coach. All right, thank you. It should be a whole lot of fun. Purdue and Gonzaga, the winner to play Duke tomorrow on ABC. We've got the second half of this one coming your way right after this. Welcome back to ESPN's Feast Week, presented by Lowe's, all part of the Phil Knight legacy. And Shulman J. Billis with you here at the Moda Center in Portland. Second half action between West Virginia and Portland State, the winner to play Florida. For fifth place on Sunday, the loser will take on Oregon State. West Virginia in blue with a 17 point lead. Jay, they shot better than 65% of the first half. And really did a good job forcing turnovers. Forced 16 Portland State turnovers and scored efficiently off those for the most part. I thought Kedrian Johnson was really good. I'm sure Bob Huggins would say, hey, turn the ball over a few times, but uh, he was all over the place on defense and I thought really had a good first half. Yeah, 12 points and four steals. And that was him, wasn't it? Finding Emmett Matthews up above the crowd. It was. That's assist number three. And he's all he also drew five fouls in that first half. Corner three, a little bit short for Bobby Harvey. In the back come the Mountaineers. West Virginia trying to push the pace. That's yet another foul on that same kind of play for Iman. He actually has to give ground there if he wants to get that call. If he's going to throw his chest into the offensive player, they're going to call that every time. And he's got three of them to prove it. You know, we've talked a little bit about this. Bob Huggins has had different kinds of teams over the years in Morgantown, and this is not quite as maybe physical a team as he's had in some of the other years, but you look at the options, the length, the guys who can get up and down the floor. I mean, I, I think they'll be able to score pretty well this year. They're going to do just fine. I mean, Kansas lost today to Tennessee and only scored 50 points. You know, it's not like there are juggernauts. I mean, I think Baylor is really good. Yep. You know, they're, they're really good teams in the Big 12. But 
this is a better team, I think, overall than Bob Huggins had last year. Substantially better. Early sub as Kedrian Johnson has gone to the bench and Joe Toussaint has taken his place. Goes under the screen on Parker. Parker feeds the post. Iman, boy, we told you he doesn't look to score very often. Good, good reach there on that jump hook. Yeah, got into it with fluidity. Now Bell, two physical guys down in the post. Offensive foul called on Bell. A little bit too much banging, a little bit too much shoulder. Though it seems like the officials will let you get away with a couple of bumps, you know, to dislodge. But once you turn and get sideways, he was he was almost facing on to Iman and went right through his chest. And you're right, Toussaint went under because Parker's not a perimeter shooter. There's not as much resistance in the post. Starks with a burst of speed. It won't go, but he draws the foul. And that'll be on Eric Stevenson. His third. Starks had some good moments against Gonzaga. Had 11 points in that one. He's a good passer and he can operate at times. He can initiate offense as a primary handler. Two years in the junior college ranks, one year at Georgia. This is his second year at Portland State. Of course, uh, everybody got an extra year because of the COVID season. So if you wanted to use a fifth year, you could. And so many players across the country, Jay, have decided to use that fifth year. Yeah, they've used it, and some have used it. NIL's been a, a big factor for a lot of a lot of players. It hasn't been the only factor, but it's certainly been a, a substantial one. And I'm one of those that that thinks it's a great thing. And you know, for those that say, hey, I believe in education and all that, and they've talked about this isn't about money, it's about education. Well, these players are staying in school longer, and that's supposed to be a good thing. Yeah, there's no question college basketball is an older sport right now than it's been in the recent past. Yeah, you are getting up there. <laughs> I'm, but I'll always be chasing you. <laughs> and I'll never catch you. Mitchell with a slam. Oh, if you had your way, you, you'd catch me and pass me. <laughs> oh, you talk about working hard. Isaiah Johnson, he was just determined to get a shot off. Yet another transition basket. Just a great pass by Toussaint, and that's, that's the right way to play angles. We saw Seth Wilson give the ball up, and then that was just a, a terrific pass by Toussaint. West Virginia winning the fast break points battle 26 to 5, and a lot of that is the turnovers that they forced. And another one here as Starks gives it up. Toussaint up top, and Wagi can't finish it, but he's fouled as he hits the deck hard. Yeah, Starks went right up underneath him. Those are scary plays. You wonder if they're going to go look at that to make sure it wasn't flagrant. He was in a vulnerable position and was the contact. You know, if it was just an unintentional brush, whatever. But you can see Starks on the ball, then trying to get back. I, I don't know if you can call that flagrant. But I think you're right. Sometimes I think they take the vulnerability of the offensive player into account. But you're right. There, there was very little contact. Very little. There, to the point, like, you know, look, incidental contact doesn't mean, you know, you just brush each other. You, you can have violent incidental contact. Uh, but but I, I, I think your point is exactly right. Because of the vulnerability of the offensive player, you know, are you required like just because he didn't make a play on the ball there he couldn't get there right but he was trying you know he's trying to and kind of gave up on the play just at the end but that that would be a harsh sanction doesn't matter in this game but it'd be a harsh sanction generally so it's either two free throws if it's a common foul or two in the ball if it's a flagrant
best news is Waggy's okay because you just never know what's going to happen. Yes, right? absolutely. And Earl Walton, Scott Brown looked at it. Now Scott Brown has called Darren George over, so Darren George will take his place and look at it along with Walton. Without question, no intent. Like you said, you said it very well. He went up trying to make a play, then he realized, hey, I can't get there, and and tried to back off and just land, but there was a little bit of contact. Yeah, the, con the contact was so minimal. And look, reasonable minds could differ on all this, but I can't imagine they're going to do anything here. It doesn't look like they are. So just a common foul, and I think everybody agrees that's probably the right call. So two free throws for Wagi. And some good sportsmanship there as Wagi was making his way to the free throw line. Starks just gave him a little pat on the back and said something to him. Uh, obviously something to do with, hey man, didn't mean to do it. Well, that's the third free throw we have seen Wagi take in this game. He needs a little more arc on that shot, Mr. Billis. It's all physics and ball bearings these <laughs> days, Dan. Yeah, the higher. There you go. The more arc, the bigger the basket gets. Twenty point lead for the Mountaineers three minutes into the second half. West Virginia's done a nice job of making the catch difficult and extending the catch. There's a little low cross screen there to free up Iman in the low post. Well, Gee called for the foul, and that's going to send him to the bench as a conquo's coming in. Bob Huggins really shuttling three different big guys in there. I love when one of his players picks up a foul, gets called out of the game, and they try to get by him to the bench, but he stops them to deliver a message. Parker driving and draws the foul. Really good drive by Parker because he continued to go into the contact rather than letting the defense angle him out. Number three on Toussaint. Well, he got away, away with a little bit of a push at the start, but just resolute to get past Joe Toussaint. So already four different Mountaineers with three fouls, just 3.15 into the second half. You know, it's been th this comfortable lead for quite some time, but you know, with the way you know, Satterfield can shoot the ball and Hunter Woods, if Portland State can get some turnovers, they could whittle this lead down a little bit and make it interesting. And Bob Huggins yelling at one of the officials right now about the bump on the perimeter, saying if it's a foul at one end, it's got to be a foul at the other. Well, he's right, but... Toussaint, nice little bounce pass inside, and now we have a foul going against the Vikings. And Kedrian Johnson coming back into the game for the Mountaineers as Toussaint goes out. Johnson a dozen points and four steals in the game for West Virginia. He basically had that at halftime. Too much dribbling the ball stayed on one side of the floor. And that's got to be something and it's a travel. Yeah. Lost it on the way up, caught it coming down, and Matthews turns it back over to Portland State. Well, we have seen some ragged play here to start the second half. Drew Timmy on his way in. The Zags are heading into the building for a big time matchup with Zach Eady and Purdue. And we'll have it for you after this one, 11.30 Eastern, just over an hour from now on ESPN. 60-42 West Virginia with a timeout on the floor.
ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by Lowe's. It's the best place to get everything you need for the holidays. Well, Bob Huggins, a graduate of West Virginia. And coaching at his alma mater, he has won 339 games with the Mountaineers, 920 in all. Tied for third all-time men's division one win list. And you can see he's still got the passion. He was a good player at West Virginia. And obviously one of the, the truly great coaches, not only now, but one of the truly great coaches I've ever seen. And Bob, Bob is extraordinarily smart. I mean, he was essentially Phi Beta Kappa when he was in college. Starks, strong move to the to the goal to lay it in. Maybe he's magna cum laude. I don't know what any of those things mean. He was smart is what you're saying. He still is. One yeah, of the other he was smart. Yeah. He still is. <laughs> One of the other names on that list, Roy Williams. He's in Portland. He has been watching not only North Carolina basketball. We have seen him at some other games as well. Johnson runs into his own man, Mitchell. And then Mitchell inadvertently knocks down a Portland State player. That doesn't like count. Start. No. When you charge into your own player and he charges into another, that's yeah. <laughs> that was like bowling pins falling. I have never seen yeah. seen it quite like that. Boy, out of that last time out, Portland State has come out stronger. I mean, they've cut this to 14 now, with a lot of time left and the ability to force turnovers, as Jay mentioned earlier. If they can get a couple more, a couple more stops and scores, and all of a sudden there's a little game pressure on West Virginia, and who knows, maybe it tighten up a little bit. How many times have we seen that, where the the team that is expected to win is getting challenged, they get a little bit tight. I mean, we're a long way from that, but 14 in today's game is not a, it's not as comfortable a lead as one might think. Matthews with a height advantage left it short and it's down to the Vikings. Just a tough shot well defended. Parker the lefty too strong off the glass Mountaineer ball. Good challenge at the rim. It's a foul there. And there's a foul there and it's going against Kedrian Johnson on the charge and that will be number three on him. The fifth Mountaineer to pick up his third foul. Now Johnson should have come to a two footed jump stop. But that's what Bob Huggins I think has been talking to the officials about. I mean that's a foul there. He had two hands on the ball handle to help change his path. Why do you think it is that you don't see as many players as you would like to see come to a stop in the paint two foot jump stop go up and elevate. It's not as much fun. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's more fun to get to the basket right. and try to make a play. If you can, yeah. But when you, you know, you come off that two-footed jump stop, then you can you can make a, you can still go up for the shot, but you can also spray it, pass it out. When I say spray it, I mean pass it out. Just gives you options. Lute Olson, you say years ago, use the free throw line, especially in transition, use the free throw line as a stop sign. And they'll let, let things open up for you. But like you say, guys always get in deeper than that now. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, one of the things is the, the, jump, uh, the jump stop changed over the years. Now when you come to a two-footed jump stop, you used to be able to come to a jump stop and then pivot. And now if you, if, if you come to a staggered jump stop, you know, where you, one foot is your pivot foot, if you land left foot right, you can still pivot off your left foot. If you come to a two-footed jump stop and then you try to pivot, the officials are going to call it a, a walk on you. Isaiah Johnson at the line for the Vikings. Spent a couple of years with Oregon State. And if Portland State loses this game, they will play Oregon State. They'll play the Beavers for seventh place in this bracket. And they just beat the Beavers in Corvallis last week by 13. Yeah, Isaiah Johnson is from Torrance, California. Went to Bishop Montgomery High School. And he was all CIF and Daily Breeze player of the year. I mean, if you're all CIF in California, you're the real deal. 
Nice little run here for Portland State. 8-0 to cut it down to a dozen. That's Parker on a switch. Boy, what a poor decision by Toussaint. Tried to take advantage of the switch, but wasn't looking at the secondary defender. And Parker, with no resistance at all, gets right to the rim. Now there's going to be some substitutions here. Yep. You wonder if a timeout might not be in order, but I think Bob Huggins is going to wait for the next media timeout. A foul on Starks in what is now a 10-0 run for the Vikings. Just a, a poor pass. You, you can't just look at your teammate there. You've got to look at the backside of the defense. And you wind up giving up an easy basket in transition over a fairly simple decision to make on your offensive end. That's where poor offense you know, really compromises your defense. You cannot guard runouts. Fourth foul on Starks, fifth on the Vikings. West Virginia is already over the limit. Another switch. Tucson should take on Iman here. Floater. Got it. And I don't think Portland State can afford to switch that. I mean, obviously, it, it puts Satterfield on Jimmy Belt Jr., which is no good for Portland State, but it's worse when you got a big guy guarding Tucson. And Tucson with back-to-back -back buckets for the Mountaineers. Now that's that's the answer Bob Huggins was looking for and didn't need a timeout in order to get that answer. Parker again. Finds the cutter and Johnson knocks it down. That was good communication by Parker. Iman was coming out to set a ball screen. He basically told him, just ghost it, get out. And that way he could drive Toussaint to the left, draws help by getting downhill, and then able to drop it off. Just a smart play by a really smart player in Cameron Parker. Women's brackets. Here at the Phil Knight Legacy and Invitational in our next game on the men's side, Gonzaga taking on Purdue. You can see it about 52 minutes from now on ESPN. That UConn-Iowa game is going to be fun. There, there's no player in college basketball I enjoy watching more than Caitlin Clark at Iowa. And she is a baller. And AZ Fudd at, at UConn ain't bad either. It's just too bad Paige Beckers is out for the year with that injury. Cross screen down low and the duck in. Well defended by Woods. Mitchell working hard to get a shot off. And Wagi got held. I think it's Isaiah Johnson who will get called for the foul. Not surprising, I guess, given the style of play that both teams play, Jay. But this game has now had 38 fouls and 33 turnovers committed in it. They're, they're scoring points, but it's not like it's been a, you know, kind of wide open, free flowing kind of game. Yeah, both teams go after you, and they're physical, so there's been a ton of bumping. You know, the truth is, there could have been a lot more fouls called, honestly, but there have been a number of offensive fouls called, too. Yeah, but the, another one. the turnovers are, are concerning. Uh, I think for, for Bob Huggins, a, a lot of their turnovers, as I saw them, I would call them unforced. You know, they're, they're turnovers based upon poor decisions. That's the seventh team foul on Portland State, so now it's bonus both ways. Trey Mitchell at the line for West Virginia. Grew up in Pittsburgh, as we mentioned, a couple of years at UMass. Then last year down in Austin with the Longhorns, and now he has transferred to Morgantown. You know, the game always evolves, and you should, I, I think the rules committee should always look at rules changes. But I, I've contemplated this for a long time. I don't know what the right answer is, but I've always felt like there should only be one free throw for the value of, of what you were fouled for. So common foul, one free throw, for two points. The G League does that, I believe. Right? I think it's great. Yeah. They're, they're, I, I've always had the thought that, you know, if I foul you on the layup, on a layup, yeah. and you don't make it, why, why do you have to shoot two free throws? 
It should just be one. It certainly speed the game up. Yeah. I don't know how people, it, it's certainly non-traditional as well, but if we kept a tradition, we'd be shooting on a peach basket right now. <laughs> Underhanded. Wagi the handoff. Wilson trapped in the corner, finds a teammate. Out of bounds, still Mountaineer ball with three on the shot clock. And I'm in the back into the game in the middle for Portland State. Plenty of time for even a catch, one dribble, and pull up. And again, the officials are trying to get the players to tone it down a little bit, especially in dead ball situations. Boy, I don't know if Mitchell knew there were three seconds on the clock there, the way he initially caught the ball and didn't start making a move right away. I think he knew. Everybody was yelling out. There's not a lot of crowd noise right now. Everybody's yelling out three seconds. Does not get it off, so it's a violation on the Mountaineers. Another turnover. Parker. And the offensive foul is called on the cutter, Jarrell Satterfield. And that'll be number three on him. Wagi sliding over to take the charge. Yeah, smart by Tucson to take it down a little bit lower if he's trying to feed the post. But he just lost control of that dribble. Hunter Woods in transition. And Parker is fouled by Wagi. That was the equivalent, Dan, of a two-footed jump stop right there. And that gives the opportunity to pivot, then throw it out, then you can play off the closeout. You know, it looked like Satterfield had a shot, but he found Cameron Parker in the, the corner. And that way, you know, watch this drive here. That, that, that's a smart play. Instead of going in there and charging, trying to get to the rim, you know, he kicks it back out. Now, all of a sudden, the defense is in rotation. And that second drive is even more effective. Some of it is analytics, of course. The two things that are emphasized as being the most efficient are layups or dunks, like getting to the rim, or threes. Right. So you try for one. If you can't get one, you look for the next, the next best option. And they're connected. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you throw it out to a three-point shooter and the defense has to really close out hard, you can drive that, get another opportunity, pass out of it. You know, those paint touches really are debilitating to a defense. That's why dribble penetration against the zone is so debilitating. It forces help. That's a good, good shot fake. Mitchell got his man in the air, finds a wide open Wilson who knocks down the three. Now, that's just simple offense. And Trey Mitchell with that great shot fake got the defense off balance. Then he can attack and play out of it. West Virginia not taking a ton of threes in this game, but doing a nice job when they do. They are 5 for 11 from beyond the arc. Simple shot fake. And Iman leaves the floor. All of a sudden, Woods has to come over and help. And Portland State is not only in rotation, but in scramble. I'm sure he didn't leave his feet? No, you don't leave your feet. <laughs> the great Steve Yoder yeah. told me that in the Birmingham airport. Why do you always guys, why do you guys always say leave your feet? You can't leave your feet. You leave the floor. Your feet go with you. Is that your Steve Yoder impersonation as well? Yeah, it had a profound <laughs> impact on my broadcasting. I, I haven't yeah. said leave your feet since, and unless explaining to you that you shouldn't say leave your feet anymore. <laughs> Ninth team foul as Toussaint heads to the line. The only other, the only other criticism that I get that is really meaningful is from my wife who says, stop saying very unique. Oh, I know. It's either unique or it's not. There are no gradations to unique. Listen, I've spent enough time with you, Steve Yoder, and your wife have been major influences on my life as well. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while on game day, yeah. 
I'll say I'll say very unique and then wink at Reese Davis because yeah. I know I'm going to get a text message from yeah. my wife. Wow, Mitchell got all of that and then some. The other advice I get from my wife is, uh, would you like your shoes in the closet or do you want to leave them on the kitchen counter? <laughs> she always asks me that question. And I never really know the right answer. Satterfield, too strong. Mitchell kept it alive, but eventually tipped it to Woods and then bumped into him to foul him. Good effort, but it didn't turn out so well for Trey Mitchell. And we got double bonus the rest of the way both ways. How many years has it been now that Bob Huggins has been using the stool? It's seven, eight, I would say, at least been a while. Well, having known him for quite some time, I know he's done a lot of great work all over the country in a stool, not necessarily at <laughs> games. <laughs> He, he looks right now like he's sitting on a stool. Where is my drink? That's right. My drink's late. Eric Mosley, our outstanding producer, telling us that he believes that. And Mike Roy, our outstanding director, they're sharing the credit, I'm being told now, telling us that one of Bob Huggins' stools is at the Hall of Fame in Springfield. He does look comfortable there. Certainly dressed comfortably. He's got yep. a different top on. I guarantee you those are the same sweatpants he wore yesterday. <laughs> When's the last time you saw him in a jacket and tie? Other than maybe the Hall of Fame induction. I think it was uh, the Big East tournament. Might have been the Big East tournament. He had a uh, he had a yellow suit and uh, he, he wore like a yellow or mustard colored suit. Yeah. And Bob Knight told him he goes. Huggins, you look like about 300 pounds of butter. <laughs> <laughs> what did Huggy Bear say back? He laughed. Yeah. <laughs> Huggs has a great sense of humor. Yes, and yeah. other coaches love talking to Bob Huggins. Well, anybody that talks to him yeah. loves him. I mean, he, he likes to come across as gruff, uh, and, and sometimes in press conferences he talks, he talks in a very low tone. Yes. Bob, uh, what happened offensively? We didn't make sure. Yeah. No make sure. Yeah. Don't make sure. <laughs> he does not need to raise his voice <laughs> to get his point across, though. But does. Yeah. <laughs> not not with the media. <laughs> no, yeah. He's he's great with the media, but but uh, his players know he's got a, a decibel level that can reach a uh, jet engine at times. His practices when he was at Cincinnati were legendary. Well, those were some of the toughest teams that we've ever seen, right? Back in those days. <laughs> I mean, you you did the game. There, there was a game in the Alaska shootout when he had Kenron, uh, Kenyon Martin and uh, Melvin Levitt. Remember Melvin Levitt? Sure. And that game you did, I think it was uh, it was Cincinnati Duke in the final, the Great Alaska Shootout that Correct. ended on a, a long pass where Martin tipped it to Levitt and Levitt dunked it. Yeah. And you can still hear the echoes in Alaska. That was one of the great dunks of all time. Stevenson draws a foul to send us to the under eight media timeout. West Virginia up 14 on Portland State. There's two pit bulls in this game right now. There's two. Okay. There's only one bone. Okay. We eating tonight or not? Yeah, Let's go eat tonight. Yeah. Hey. Well, again, not surprisingly, it has been a physical game. Both coaches talk about toughness and being physical, and maybe we shouldn't be surprised at how many collisions there have been, how many fouls there have been. There have been 45 fouls committed in this game. And again, it's uh, you know kind of the way uh, that you know both coaches preach toughness. That's what they want out of their teams. One's been at it a lot longer than the other. It has not been a masterpiece by by any stretch of the imagination with all the contact and all the whistles but they're both playing really physical basketball it has definitely not been a masterpiece more of a caveman drawing <laughs> but if any player in this game were to get a double double points and rebounds or points and assists it's automatically a triple double because you, if you factor in bruises cuz everybody's going to have double digit bruises in this one they get a day off tomorrow and then they both play again on sunday 
Matthews for three. Munson a strong rebound. Good outlet. Offensive foul on Cameron Parker. His third. I promise you Cameron Parker right now. He's not saying anything, but I promise you he's thinking, what do I weigh, 130? He was there. Now you got Parker on Mitchell. Mitchell needs to post him here. Gonna get a little baseline cut, a little flex cut, duck in. Well done. And they convert. And that easily could have been an N1, and that's exactly what Mitchell's saying right now. But just a little simple flex cut along the baseline by Stevenson. The screener, Mitchell, and then he just ducks in. Satterfield Sox almost lost had that. It. Yep. And he drive playoff two feet. Satterfield gets the shot off. Tipped back out, but into the hands of Tucson. And now Tucson fouled by Satterfield at the other end. So Jace Coburn, uh, more evidence of the kind of attitude that he's got, the kind of feistiness he's got. He was extremely into martial arts as a kid. And I'm sure he, he gave as good as he got back in the day, and he's still got that kind of intensity and attitude about him now as a coach. Going a little low with that kick. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you're four foot two, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. This is mom. They own a dojo. Yeah, below the belt, I guess when it's with a kid. Well, you got to be clear, below my belt or below your belt? <laughs> Mom and dad in that shot. Second year after eight years as an assistant. On the other side of the bracket, on the Invi Phil Knight Invitational side, the Portland Pilots knocked off Villanova today. Villanova struggling without a couple of really important players in Whitmore and Moore. But, you know, teams like Portland and Portland State who do not play at the level of conference that most of these other programs do, this is a great opportunity for them in their hometown to have big time programs come here and they get a chance to play against three quality opponents. It's a great opportunity and not not only for Portland to get a win over Villanova but these players want to play in these big time games. Even if Portland State loses this one they get a game against Oregon State on Sunday and again that's an opponent they are familiar with they just beat them last week. I think Oregon State wants another shot. Absolutely. By the way, a few moments ago, it was Jarrell Satterfield who fouled out of the game for Portland State. Eight points in 29 minutes tonight. Just a really solid, smart player at the point in, in Cameron Parker, the Beaverton, Oregon. Native. He really makes them go. Yeah, really a nice player. Makes a lot of good decisions. Woods has great length on the perimeter. Nice good kick. Pass. Yep. Mitchell to Toussaint. And he returns the favor. Lost out of bounds to the Vikings. Number four in blue, Jamel King is into the game for the first time for West Virginia. 6'7 sophomore from Uniontown, Alabama. And Starks called for the foul. Toussaint stayed right in front of him and took the charge. And that'll be number five on Michael Starks. And he is not happy about it. Lowered that shoulder, went right through the chest. Of Joe Toussaint. 
He was moving obliquely. <laughs> Starks out. Saunders coming back in. Boy, Joe Toussaint looks like he's going to be a really important part of this West Virginia team this year. No question. He and Kedrian Johnson can share the ball handling responsibilities. And Toussaint has always been, when he was at Iowa, a good passer. It's open for a three. Long rebound to Mitchell. Toussaint driving now, left hand. And that basket is going to count. Strong take by Toussaint. A little floater game off the glass. Nice crossover. And the defense couldn't get there coming over from the weak side to get in front. Just angled out. That's just a pretty play with the left hand. Had 18 points and five assists in a recent win over Pitt. They beat Pitt by 25. West Virginia beat Penn by 34. They can put some points on the board this year. And Toussaint was good, I thought, against Purdue. At 16 points, grabbed five rebounds, had four assists. When Johnson was in foul trouble, Johnson, if I remember right, picked up a couple early, didn't yep. play much at all in the first half, and never really could establish any rhythm as a result of it. What a contest there defensively as Eric Stevenson gets back on the play. Didn't want to give up an easy one. Just a, a very casual pass that Woods was allowed to take the other way. It's hard to believe that's not a foul. That is a foul. Mitchell inside. That'll be his third. I mean, he hit it. He grabbed him first and with his left arm. I mean, it, it, that's a foul. He grabbed his right arm with his left. Whether he got him up top or not. But that was a transition play. Sometimes it's tough for the officials to get down to see that. So Hunter Woods at the line. 6'6", six, six, junior from Pasadena. As Stevenson goes out and Wilson checks back in for the Mountaineers. Another guy that was all CIF. Makes them both. And they're going to keep pressuring. That's what they do. Good pass. Three good passes in a row and a high percentage look from three for Seth Wilson. That's how you do it. You pass it out of the post and then whip it around. The ball moves faster than the defense can move. Saunders on the drive and the 6'5 junior from Brampton, Ontario lays it in. Boy, that was a good take. It could have been an N1 as well. Had a hand in his back, but really strong to the basket. Crossover by Tucson. Wilson fumbled it trying to get it to Matthews and they still get the shot off and Matthews knocks it down. And those corner threes. That's one efficient place to get off a three point shot. Two good possessions in a row with the offensive end for the Mountaineers resulting in threes. Iman is fouled. We'll step aside 324 to go. How about the ball moving Jay for the Mountaineers? Well the first one the ball goes out of the post and you have a long closeout to get to the corner shooter then a little shot fake. Same thing just hard to recover. A storied career for Bob Huggins 41 years as a head coach after a very good playing career at West Virginia back in the 70s. 16th season as the head coach at his alma mater a final four 10 trips to the NCAA tournament over 900 career wins a Hall of Fame inductee and most importantly Jay 
a gold suit. Is it yellow? Is it gold? It sounds a little bit better if you say gold. That might be yellow. What do you think? It's, uh, yeah, that's mustard that's yellow. mustard yellow? All right. I'm not sure the shoes are big sellers. <laughs> but we were talking about, yeah. you know, Bob Huggins at not only West Virginia, but back to his days at Cincinnati. He's also the head coach at Akron and Kansas State. But if you were to ask him, you know, who's the toughest player to ever play for you? I wonder what his answer would be, whether you'd say you know, Kenyon Martin or Danny Fortson going back to Cincinnati. You know, Deshaun Butler was a, a really tough player that he had at, at West Virginia. But well, he had some great teams. Yeah. His teams, his peak teams at Cincinnati looked like bodybuilders oh. when they walked into the gym. And, you know, he took a, that Cincinnati team to the 92 Final Four. I remember right, that team had Nick Van Exel on it. Yeah, their practices were like fist fights. It was like an MMA. Good look from Matthews inside to Bell. It was a breakdown defensively. A smart move by Matthews. It looked like he had to dribble it to corral that ball and decided not to dribble again and maybe pick up a double dribble. Pretty impressive number here. 18 assists on 29 made baskets for the Mountaineers, and especially in the second, in the first half, a lot of it was turning over Portland State, getting out in transition, getting to the paint. But a lot more ball movement here in the second half. Yeah, West Virginia's forced 23 turnovers from Portland State. The problem is the Mountaineers have turned it over 19 times themselves. Matthews gives it up to Toussaint with five on the shot clock. Has to elevate, leaves it short. It grazed the rim, so they get a fresh 20 out of it. Jace Coburn is yelling, saying, I didn't see it hit the rim. Well, you don't have to see it. The officials do. <laughs> the officials saw it. Yeah. And now they'll talk about it. That hit the rim. Now the officials will go have a look at it to confirm what we were just able to see. I think they should take oh. your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> the Boilermakers are in the house. Purdue and Gonzaga in a game that we are really looking forward to. Coming up with a spot in the championship game of the Phil Knight Legacy Bracket. The winner will play Duke for a championship and the loser of that game will play Xavier in the third place game. Drew Timmy and the Zags, Zach Eady, and the Boilermakers. Shot clock at three. Matthews gets it off. Jamel King with a putback. And Jimmy Bell Jr. kept that ball alive. He was behind a blackout, just took a swipe at it, and kept it alive so a teammate could grab it. Jace Coburn's got a little bit deeper into his bench. Boy, Parker is good at leaning in and taking the foul. This Hayden Curtis and Trey Wood have both checked in now for the Vikings. Yeah, it just shows how smart that Cameron Parker is because he had an angle and the defender wasn't in legal guarding position. So you have full rights as the offensive player. And now Parker going to shoot free throws, what, 12 and 13 here? That's the seventh foul that he has drawn in this game. And as a good free throw shooter, that's a good thing for him. He's put together back to back really good games with a 16.8 assist performance and a really good floor game against Gonzaga. And then to come in here, what do you have now? 18? And he does one more free throw coming. A couple of subs now for Bob Huggins as well. Josiah Davis, 6'3 freshman from Kitchener, Ontario, and Patrick Sumnick. A 6'8 sophomore from Green Bay into the game. 13 for 13 from the line and likely the end of the night for Cameron Parker. Two really good games as you said. He's had a couple of performances worthy of voodoo donuts. <laughs> Those things are good man. Yeah. Walt Walton's on to something. There are donuts everywhere around this place. 
Somehow saved by Davis. Off to Sumnick. Hey, and the two guys who just got into the game. One gets an assist, one gets a bucket. And that's not an easy shot by Sumnick. That was a really nice touch along the baseline. Those are hard shots. Saunders. And when you ask who the foul's on, what would Bill Raffrey say? Take your Take pick. Take your pick. Excellent story. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> so Trey Mitchell and Emmett Matthews, and there was some foul trouble for them to deal with last night. But what a difference 24 hours makes! Looks at look at the production by them. Yeah, and there's uh, there's a, a difference between those two performances. Obviously, one of the differences is one was Zach Eady, the other was without Zach Eady. <laughs> You know, one name we should mention, Jose Perez, who was on the West Virginia bench. He was a player at Manhattan. Steve Masiello was dismissed just a couple of weeks before the season. A number of players left. Perez, really good player, transferred to West Virginia, but it's in the hands of the NCAA right now when he will be eligible to play. They would love to get him. Davis inside, had it blocked. And now numbers. When Bobby Harvey looked like he actually had a lane to the basket, he, he kind of kept going straight, and he went around the defender. He yeah, went around the defender and then took it right into the path yeah. of his teammate. Drew Timmy wait, ready to get going here tonight in the second game. The Zags and the Boilermakers will be on the court momentarily. Bell double teamed and has it taken away, gets it back. King. And Curtis now with a rebound with a shot clock now turned off here at the Moda Center. West Virginia will play Florida for fifth, and Portland State will play Oregon State for seventh in the Phil Knight legacy bracket. That is a friendly bounce for Isaiah Kirby. And that is your ball game. Win number 921 for Bob Huggins as he moves ahead of Jim Calhoun into sole possession of third place on the all time men's division one win list. He's got some thoughts for Jace Coburn who I'm sure is soaking this in right now getting some advice from a Hall of Famer at the end of the game. 89 71 your final score as West Virginia defeats Portland State. If you're going somewhere, don't go for long. We've got Purdue and Gonzaga coming up on ESPN. The game will tip off 25 minutes from now. It should be great. Create amazing work with.